for this, for the people who are, for all of you who are very sort of uh, focused on what we're actually going to go through, this is kind of the, what we're going to go through. The only difference is I moved government role up a little bit higher because it's a bit more uh, interesting. Uh, well, well, we can say critical, if you know what I mean. So, so the thing about government is people have different opinions on how much government should do or how much it shouldn't do. You know, if you're thinking about your council or your, your state or federal government in central politics, all that's really happening is there, people are arguing over how much government should do and what sectors of the economy it should control and what it shouldn't control. So basically, most arguments on government are that government should do X, government should do why, but really they're arguing along the line and the Liberal and Labor Party are within the, this range in the line and what they do is make themselves seem very different so that you vote for them but at the end of the day they're very similar because they have the, the same range yeah? and if you were to go to the United States the Democrats and Republicans make themselves seem different at the periphery but they actually vote the same way remarkably often. Uh, there's some interesting things that happen there. So, I'll just mention this first and then talk a bit of, just a bit of context. So every year, you might have seen some ranking in the newspaper about livability, that's one ranking uh, you get every year. And the other one you might have seen is something about the world's most innovative city or the world's most smart city sometimes they talk about, or creative cities or advanced technology. This is, the, a lot of that's our data. So when you see something that's not livability, it's often our data. It's often some sort of thing there. And when they say a city is really technologically advanced, or they say a city is really economically focused, or they say a city is really creative, it's often our data. And you might have an opinion, and often people do when they read a city ranking, they're like, Sydney, how can Sydney be good? How can, why does Vienna always win? Why are the Swiss so good, you know? I mean, I've been to Switzerland, it's freezing cold, uh, you get stuck on a train station at 5 a.m. It is one of the most horrific places to be. As cold goes, they win, right? So we're going to talk about that. Right, so we use our data uh, to assist other people. So, and I'll kind of go through that. So, what makes a city creative or innovative? We'll get into that in a sec. So, this is some of the places I, I've been to. That's the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development. If you're wondering about the diversity of the shot, what they did was they staged it by pushing people to the front and then they created a sort of diverse photo, uh, but it was all staged and it was actually the opposite. So it was just, uh, I mean, the lady at the front, she is a senior in there and she's from um, kind of a mixed background, but they basically just did it as a staged event. So it was quite interesting. But the, the talk was very interesting. That's in Sri Lanka, that's teaching about 120 people. That's the Australian government's um, incubator. We were there, and there's some analysts I work with, uh, or have worked with. That's a couple of years ago now. But just makes a nice photo. We're all having pizza. I mean, who doesn't like pizza, right? Uh, so we beat. Uh, one of the things we did was we beat a, a consulting team's own team. We used algorithms to beat a consulting team in their country. So if they were in another country where we provided data, and we provided data against the in-country team and managed to beat them because their, their data was actually false. Uh, it was actually fake data. Uh, so we were in the government incubator and I spoke at those two organisations and where else? did some work for Paris and Vienna and a few other places. Lots of interesting little bits and pieces all over the world. And I'm doing a project in Africa at the moment, which is really interesting. So trying to help Africa innovate uh, through an insurance company. So, so all remotely. So it's really quite strange. So I'm one of those people who's done lots of interesting things. Uh, we have a small group that, you know, I've done really it's a mix of everything. And it's sort of uh, quite strange, all the things I've done in my life. So, but, um, so one of the things we came up with is a, a framework for innovation. So what I'm gonna do is just start talking about uh, innovation and what it is, because most people don't agree. And then you can, if you've got a question about it as you go along, please talk about it. So the first thing people think is innovation is creativity, yeah? So if you come up with an idea, that's innovation. But really, that's only about a quarter of it. Because once you've got to come up with the idea, you've got to actually implement it. And if you haven't implemented it, you can't, it's not really, it has, nothing's happened. 
So a good example of that is Kevin Rudd's Idea Festival. Does anybody remember that? Yeah. He had an idea festival where he had people come up with a thousand ideas, all on butcher's paper. Virtually none of it happens. And this often happens at, when you have a, uh, a boot camp, you know, where they have a boot camp for ideas at the university. They come up with thousands of ideas and everybody channels them and then they just disappear. And I've been involved in a few of those processes. And so I don't count ideas as innovation. So to be innovation, it has to be implemented and marketed or communicated. So if it's not private sector, it would be communicated to its government. So that'd be government public relations have to talk about it, yeah? So someone has to actually get it out into the market. It has to be the right time. And the easiest sort of idea of that is the iPhone. Does anybody know the precursor to the iPhone developed in the early 90s sort of thing? Yeah, well before that even there was a thing called a, the, uh, it's like a little handhold thing called a Newton, remember, remember that? And Steven Seagal, Under Siege, he sends a fax from the train, remember that? So anyway, in the movie Under Siege 2, he sends a fax from the train. So Steve Jobs, to develop the iPhone, tried to develop it before the technology was ready. And did he actually get an iPhone? No, he didn't get it then, but he got it you know, 15 years later. So it took 15 years for the tech to catch up. So if it's the wrong time, you've got this brilliant idea for something you want to build. You've got to assess whether your brilliant idea for a business is the right time or not, because you know, often things are ahead of the curve and uh, you know, it's the wrong time. So to in effect, it has to be an idea, has to be implemented, communicated, and has to be at the right time. If it's not at the right time, it's never going to work. And this is often something government needs to do. They often come up with an idea that's like 10 years ahead or 10 years behind and then it takes so long, and by the time they actually implement it, it's no longer the right time anymore. And, and it's slow processes make this worse. And that's why you get white elephant, elephant projects. Like, you know, desalination plants you don't use, and uh, yeah. It's another concept about innovation that's quite useful, is technology is a tool. So many people think an iPhone's innovation, but is an iPhone innovation if you don't have a use for it? Yeah. You have to use it for something for it to be innovative. Uh, so iPhones have to be, they're just a tool. The platform of apps on iPhones is how you use it, yeah? So most of the time, if you've got a platform of apps, then basically uh, uh, that's how you use it. Now also, as I'm going along today, if you have any feedback, I'm using this as a test to change, to create a more common sense understanding of our framework. So if you have any feedback for me at the end, just tell me anything you think you liked or didn't like so I can sort of change things as well to help out. Because we're basically, what we try to do is help cities create innovation. And so it's hard to explain this sometimes. It gets quite complicated. You really, the more that I can try and simplify it and stop reading all the PDFs I have to read, which have these lovely, you know, $50, $50 words where a $5 word would do. Sort of thing. That's what they, they generally do. Consultants like to be paid by the barrel end. Uh, so yeah, so this is one of the things. So technology is just a, just a part of innovation, yeah. Uh, because you could have innovation in restaurants. Is that technology? Sports. Australia exports a whole bunch of sports stuff, but it's not just technology, like training methodology, but it's not technology. Uh, a new method of doing something is an innovation. So technology is just a part of it. Can you define technology then? If you're saying innovation is not technology, what are you calling technology? Technology is, a, 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 I guess, machines, processes, things like that. But innovation is a broader part of that. So often technology is more related to think electronics, programming, this sort of thing. So in, in that sense, uh, it, 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 it's the common, common sort of law usage of it. But yeah. And this is an interesting one. So one of the problems with government policy, not Malcolm Turnbull, but most of the other governments, is they focus on STEM. There's not much of a correlation between STEM and innovation. So STEM being science, technology, education, mathematics sort of thing, uh, sorry, engineering, mathematics. Um, it's basically a focus on uh, you know, teaching people how to go to do physics and chemistry and all that sort of thing. And it, it worked, that's what the Soviet Union did and it didn't actually result in a computer. Silicon Valley 
is where you got a computer, which was basically a guy called Steve Jobs, a hippie. He doesn't wear doesn't wear shoes. He likes to eat. He's a fruitarian. He went to a hippie sort of commune. Uh, him and Wozniak, who was a science geek, developed a computer. So it's kind of a combination deal. So science is important, but it's not the it's not the whole totality of stuff. You know, advertising people can have creative ideas. Food chefs can have creative ideas. Everyone in this room can have creative ideas, right? So all of you probably have good ideas that if you could implement them, they'd be useful. But it's it's uh, you know everybody has ideas, yeah? but it's hard to <coughs> implement sometimes. So basically, the idea is if you just put it in science, uh, the Soviet system didn't result in computers. Uh, if you just ramp up the number of science grants, grants you're not going to get much. Uh, and this, you need social mobility and property rights and various laws, otherwise you don't get innovation. So the Soviet Union pretty much destroyed innovation more than it made it, and most of their IP was stolen from the Americans, the French, the British, things like that. That's how they got it. They just stole it. And but the computers came from America. And one of the arguments you get is that the, um, the Soviet Union uh, fell apart because it couldn't develop computers. Because at the end of the day, every, the West had computers and we had the, the internet boom and the Soviets didn't. So in effect, it's, it's a very, the idea is add maths and science and this is what politicians think um, quite often. It doesn't really, it's not the only thing. You've got to have that, but you've also got to have other things, you know, creatives. They tend to undervalue artists. They tend to undervalue writers. They tend to undervalue engineers who are like not conventional. They tend to undervalue anybody who's creative. And they overvalue uh, physicists or chemists. Yeah? But a lot of the people that create stuff in Silicon Valley, I mean, people I know, there's a guy I know who's the best technology guy in Silicon Valley, one of the best guys, right? He's he was 22 years old when I met him. He's famous for climbing up a server, getting locked in the room, and sliding down the glass wall in his underpants. <laughs> That's what he did. Because he, he's hot in the room, and he's got up on there, he's climbing up, and he's stripped down, and he slides down the wall like this, like a, a movie cartoon. That's what he was telling, that's the story I was told when I was drinking with him. And in effect, um, he's like, he knows 20 different languages. He's never gone, to, never studied at uni. He's a total guy back. And he, runs a lot of servers. And another guy's an Aussie guy, ex-army, who runs servers and stops them exploding somehow. Like they will vibrate and stuff. He does all the stuff that stops them vibrating. These guys are not really, I mean, they are sciencey, but they're not really science. You know, they wouldn't show up in the statistics for science grads. He learned in the army, so he wouldn't show up as a scientist. So you see what I mean? Science is not necessarily, the, if you measure graduates, you're not gonna necessarily get a picture of it. And this is the final one that's interesting. There's a thing called the Harvard. Did anybody hear about the Australia's like as economically complex as Africa? Anybody hear that? We've got bags. Okay, so we got told we were economically as complex as Africa, and this caused the government to panic, like a, like it just said, we're, we're we're really good, we're really great. But yeah, it's actually true uh, to a certain extent. But the problem is Australia has a massive surface area. So some of the other countries in Europe have very small surface areas and they're not really allowing for all that. So our cities are really economically complex and our basically our country's not. Because we're a big country and we're a small city. So Melbourne and Sydney are economically complex. So if you look at the city, they, they, they do quite well. So that bagging that we got probably wasn't really that fair. And so this is an interesting way to define innovation, right? So this, you can have a, if anybody's got a question about this debate on it, we can, we can go through that. But this is, so innovation is not just change, it's something you structure, and it benefits the greater community, benefits the politicians, it benefits business. It doesn't make anybody really win too much. It's sort of like you keep everybody sort of happy, but nobody's ecstatic, is the best model. So if you like, uh, you think about the iPhone, that benefited a lot of people. So everybody used it. But if you had, uh, does anybody remember the Microsoft phones? Windows, Windows phones with the little stylus and that? I had one of those, you know. They didn't benefit enough people, so not enough people used them. And everybody remember the music player called Zune? Have you heard of that? The story of Microsoft Zune, it was like the worst. So the iPod is like the coolest thing ever that you mentioned, and the Zune is like the ugliest thing ever. And Microsoft developed the Zune, 
And that Apple just, what he did to develop the iPod, he just draw a triangle or a circle on the wall and said, make that. And that's not a scientist, that's an artist, a creative person. So the idea is if you structure change and if it benefits people, then it will work. Now some people force change, and the problem with forcing change is you create enemies, and the more enemies you create, the more the change gets unraveled. So if you do top down, force everything down on the people, then they push back. And so the idea is to, to kind of come to a consensus and work through things. The way we should do as adults, you know? Not like the clampers throwing stuff at each other. So that's kind of a definition we use in training. And nobody's, out, nobody's sort of said, been able to disprove it. You can't really disprove it. The reason being is if, you, if it's just change, you tip over a glass of water, that's change. Uh, if it doesn't benefit people, they won't support it. So that's the sort of simple definition. Now it's not the official, official one is something like a novel process. It's about you know, 50 words long and doesn't really help much. But there's about 17 or 18 sort of definitions. So one of the questions that leads to is like, what can government do? What can stakeholders do? So the answer is, if you're looking at that, you can create like a precondition for innovation. You can create the things that actually make innovation happen. So for example, if you have lots of restaurants, a small restaurants, I mean, where's, who's a, got a favorite food scene? Anybody got a favorite food scene? Like favorite place to eat, in, like in Australia or somewhere else? Like a street? Like Newbury Street in Boston or, some, or somewhere in like Chapel Street in Prague or, there's lots of famous streets, but whether there's a favourite one, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's lots of famous streets, right? But everybody's got a favourite. So there's that. That's like a cluster of places that create like innovation around food. Yeah. And if that, if it does that, then it helps create uh, innovation around food. Well, clusters of things help create innovation. So where you have like a design district that helps create innovation. So why do you need innovation? Well, it makes cities better makes the quality of life better. Generally, it lowers pollution. Uh, if people are innovative, the, the worst polluting countries are not the West, they're the Soviet countries. They always will be because the government actually is worse at polluting than private enterprise, usually. Soviet Union was one of the worst polluters. The other worst polluter in the US is the US military. Literally, the, the military dumps toxic stuff into the oceans all the time pretty much standard dump stuff and has been for a long time. So governments tend to be the worst polluters and they're the ones in charge of fixing it. It's going to work out really well. So it's going to go so well. I, I have so much faith in it's come about this particular thing that it's all going to turn out well. It's going to turn out well after a disaster. That's my opinion. But anyway, um, it'll turn out well once we all get panic. Uh, re retains residents, high property asset growth, tourists and the stronger city brand. So it becomes a place you want to go to, yeah? It helps to create a sense of belonging. So innovation can help with these different things as well. And social mobility is one of the best things because if people go up, their whole families go up. So if someone migrates here and they go from being a house cleaner to owning a restaurant in, you know, in a suburb, that creates about a few million dollars worth of economic value. A cleaner doesn't create much economic value, but someone who owns a, an Afghani restaurant creates economic value, right? Someone who creates a business creates economic value, which means that everybody's better off in the society. So social mobility is one of the best things ever. And the more, that should say diversification, I dropped a seed somewhere, lost it in the sea. But yeah, that should create something that's pretty cool and diverse. So there's lots of other things um, that can help. So I'll talk about Queensland a bit more in a moment. So I'll skip that one. So this is the index itself, and we're gonna get into the cities and that. Uh, basically, there's always indicators, and I've got some printouts here if somebody, if anybody wants some, I think some parts. There's not enough for everybody, I don't think, because we have time, and I don't want to kill an entire forest. Uh, but there is a few, I'll hand you over if you like. Uh, but um, yeah, so basically here, there's 500 cities, and there's all these benchmarking indicators. And it was started as an R&D project. 
and it took a long while to develop it. It's crazily stupid. If I had my time again, I probably would have just, I don't know, gone off and uh, got drunk instead. I'm not sure what I would have done, but I would have done something. <laughs> We would have done something, I don't know. But it, it, it's, it's a very crazy project to take on. If I'd known how much work it was going to be when I started, I don't know what I would have done. But I've done it, so... Um, well, not just I, but a group of people have done it, but it's just that it's a heck, heck of a lot of work. And so we don't focus on Australia much because in Australia, all they want to know is generally whether Melbourne's better than Sydney. And that's pretty much every headline. Or is... Brisbane is not a big country town anymore. That's the other one. Uh, how much does a how, uh, what what suburb are the house prices going up in? That's what the Herald Sun wanted to know. It was a daily yeah, Herald Sun. They wanted to know about house prices. Um, another one was they wanted to. The Age just wants to criticise every the current government, so they didn't weren't interested in innovation because that didn't make the government look bad. Uh, the ABC just really wanted us to bag people and say bad things about them. So I was on the ABC before, I don't listen anymore. But, but yeah, I had to criticise people. So they're interested if I criticise a politician, they can use that against that politician they don't like. It's got nothing to do with getting facts out here. I, I have, my faith in the media is somewhere around this small. Um, but some of these media are very good. La Parisian wrote some nice articles. Uh, College Times wrote a nice piece. The US News wrote a lovely piece on Chicago. Um, and we had a couple million views on Second Sight. Uh, Boston Globe, they were very focused on coffee because they thought, why would you measure really coffee shops? But how many people work in a coffee shop? Can we get a show of hands? Who sits in a coffee shop with a laptop and does work now? Yeah? Okay, there's not very big hands, but yeah, I saw a few of you. <laughs> most, most people, if you go out and you look at startups, they'll all sit in coffee shops. So we wrote that in 2009, and then the Boston Globe picked it up and said, why would you measure coffee shops? Well, that's because we're half the people who work in creative fields sit in a coffee shop and actually work. Because you can't work in your bedroom after a while you get sick of it, right? During COVID, I mean, you get totally sick of that. So if you're creative, you tend to wander off to a coffee shop. So anyway, lots of these people, free economics were interested at one point. Um, and there's been a heck of a load of articles. My favorite one, one of them was in a Greek newspaper and they wrote a whole thing in Greek about how bad Athens was or something like that. And and so it, it, some of the angles they take are quite astonishing. They like just attack everything, or they go, you know. But anyway, fascinating stuff. So it was all an experiment, and we got some in assistance from the lovely folks at Oz Industry and Oz Trade. Um, Malcolm Turnbull's largely responsible for that. Uh, he helped a lot of people, uh, basically, with his programs, despite the fact that they don't agree with his policies and all the stuff. But, uh, and one of the early customers was Boston and some of these other places. So this is the list. Uh, for those of you who can't read that, I'll go through. Tokyo, this is 2021, during COVID. Tokyo, number one in the world. Boston, New York, Sydney, that goes up in a bit. Singapore, Dallas, Fort Worth, Seoul, Houston, Chicago, Paris, London, Silicon Valley, Atlanta, Seattle, Shanghai, Stockholm, Miami, DC, Beijing, and Los Angeles. So this is an unstable list. This is the 2019 um, list. I'll just, I'll, what I might do is just pass out the list of cities you can have a look if you've got good eyesight. So I'll pass out, if you want to take one you can, I'll just put it here, and you can just pass it around there if you want to. Um, it's, all, it's available for download, but, but anyway. Um, so, anybody have a reaction to that? Like. Yeah, I, oh, there we go. Come on, tell me the reaction. We're not the most livable cities or the wealthiest cities, so why would you want to be innovative? Okay, so you say they're not the most livable. Uh, how would you say that they're not the most livable? Singapore's pretty livable. Oh, uh, no. Singapore's so what? people are crammed in like sardines. Like, yeah, but that's, no. that's, some people want to live like that. So yeah. That's I suppose it just depends on your idea yeah. of. So, 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 I, I, so well, I it's like I'm, my reaction, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. So, you, so, what would be, well, I'll ask you, answer your first point about livability first. Livability is not a measure of how nice it is to live in a city. No. Livability is a measure of how much an expat who earns a salary at someone like ExxonMobil can afford to live in a city. Oh. So, that's your technical definition of livability from The Economist and Mercer. 
So the, the newspapers use it as something else, but it's not actual definition. Uh, so there's no real, there's no technical institute of livability, and there's nobody who defines it. It's just a news. It's a, it's designed as a measure for, um, for expats in sort of other parts of the world. Yeah. Sorry about the font size. It's the only way we can not kill a forest printing it. Um, so yeah. So that's the, that was your first question. Your second part of your question was it? Yeah. What's the second part? They weren't the most livable, and they weren't the wealthiest. You know, they weren't like New York or London or Paris. Well, or, yeah, but they are. New York and London, and Paris yeah. are there. So, but they're not at the, you know, they're not at the top. So, yeah. So wealthy is a is a funny thing. So actually, you're wealthier living in Dallas than you are living in, in New York, and there's a reason for that. A person in Dallas has to only pay, um, so salary multiples for homes. They have to pay something like five times, I can't remember the exact figure, I don't want to say it because I can't remember it, but it's lower. So in Dallas, you, an average person who earns a good job can afford a big house and have a car, two cars and they can put their kids through school and they can work less hours. So if you're in New York, you have to work in finance to do that. So New York's got a lot of finance, so I'll take your question here. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'll just, I'll just talk about this other. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's just not saying um, there's not developing countries. It's, it's, uh, sorry? No developing countries. No, because South Africa, Southeast Asia, India, etc. They're not being rented or No, so they're, they're in the full five hundred and they will be listed on the five hundred cities. So this is only the top twenty. Okay. But so they're uh, not being rated, they're just not in the top twenty. Yeah, they're all being rated. Okay. Uh, and so you've got to take them separately. Middle East is quite yeah. highly ranked. Mm -hmm. Like the Emirates and then Africa is lowly ranked and that's shown by the fact that people migrate to these cities and then migrate away from those cities. So migration tells you the truth. If you if you've got economic opportunity, why would you stay if you why would you not you know stay there? Okay, so next yeah. question with the lady, I missed her first yeah, one. But it's got a relation to that. Remember half of those are English speaking countries. Yes. So Okay, so we, but the first, our first, we, ours is the only index that has, um, good question, uh, ours has, is the only index that has an Asian country at the top. Almost everyone has a confirmation bias towards English speaking countries and or German and French speaking, so that's another problem. So they, like Switzerland always does well, Canada always does well. Uh, so ours has a slight uh, skew, but that is a reflection of capital and other things. But uh, we do measure, Across the 500, we skew according to GDP. So, in other words, we if everybody if everybody as their economy grows, we can take more countries from that region. So, we do include everyone. We're the only index that does. Yeah. Could you please explain a little bit more about uh, what kind of indicators you uh, use? Get to that. To measure yeah. that because it's very different to anything I know about. Like Amsterdam is so way below the 22, which is one of the most innovative cities in the world because of the amount of money that the council and, and the country puts into it. So and you're saying Amsterdam is Amsterdam, in the way? Yeah, Amsterdam is way Yes, top and top. Amsterdam is, but you have to, there's one thing I should clarify, this is taken during COVID, and Amsterdam used to rank third in the world, or in the top, yeah, the third in Europe, so yeah. That's, that's what yeah. it is, yeah. Yeah, so Amsterdam is a very highly ranked city, and so there's another way of looking at this, which is five-year averages. And the five-year average shows different, totally different results. So this is taken during COVID. So anybody that locked, the, the lockdowns affected a lot of that as well. And that's why Melbourne dropped out as well. Melbourne used to be higher ranked and dropped out because of lockdowns. I mean, at the time it was basically the longest lockdown city in the world and you can't have innovation if you're locking up all your creatives um, in, you know, whatever. So um, one more, was one more question? I'll, I'll go on to the next step. Okay, yeah. Yeah, where have we spent sitting? Ah, so we'll get to that in a minute, so that's the second <laughs> <laughs> question. Yeah. Uh, about Tokyo, what, what do they make any different to the other city to be the most uh, innovative city? Okay, so Tokyo, Tokyo does a really great job of a few things. They have the world's best vending machines. That's not the reason, but they have the yeah. best vending machines. But they have, so, so to be well, you have to balance. Uh, so Tokyo has a very good robotics program. Robotics is gonna be a big part of the rest of, of innovation for the future. So. Cities are going to be designed for robots. So you'll have a little door there where a robot will come out and vacuum the floor and go back into its door, just like the Jetsons. 
So you're going to design cities so robots will move around in them. <coughs> so Tokyo is well ahead on robotics, so is Boston. Boston. And Boston has got, Boston has some of the best universities. Uh, New York also has a very good robotics program. Sydney is pretty good on that. So robotics is Singapore also. So if you're skewing towards the future, there's going to be massive numbers of robots. And so once we, we're kind of getting to the point where that's becoming real, because you give AI and robots, you've got, which is maybe good news for humanity, maybe not according to Elon Musk, I don't know, but they're, fit, they're fitting them with guns. Let's not get into that, because I'll go off on a tangent. Just don't fit robots with guns, please. Actually, can I just ask one question yeah. before you move on? Yeah. But among developed cities, is a big population an advantage? Usually, yes. Mm. Sometimes, no. So it used to be an advantage. It depends on the year. So at the mar in the past, a big city is an advantage, and a bigger population is an advantage. But at the, during the pandemic, it's sort of sliding because bigger populations have more pandemic problems. So it's kind of... Uh, personally, if I was going to move, I would move to a city that... Uh, maybe mid-size on the list, you see. I wouldn't move to a big city. I would never move to New York. I dislike New York intensely. I don't want to ever live there. Um, and I, I wouldn't move to Boston, but it is a bit cold. So it's, it's sort of, yeah, it, there is a correlation, but it's complicated. It can be both, yeah. The optimal size for a city is four million people. Once you get above four million, it gets problems. Anything less than four million is not really a city. So if you're sitting around four million, it's wonderful. Berlin, four million, yeah? depending on how you measure it, three to five. Yeah. So anyway, I'll move, I'll, okay, I'll take one more question, I'll move on. I just wanna know, you mentioned uh, robotics and the role they play in innovation. I imagine it's a lot easier to import robotics than something like capital or population or culture. Yeah, yeah. but, yeah, it's true, but we do include imports in it. So we have an indicator called imports, uh, and that's included. And it is considered, but the problem with um, that is that whoever designs it uh, owns it. And so whoever designs, so did Silicon Valley benefit from the fact they developed the entire technology industry? Yes. So now it's a, a failed state over there in Silicon Valley to some extent. I mean, they have the worst crime and all this other stuff. But they developed it. They got a lot of economic growth and power out of that. So you have to argue that if you develop the robots, you're better off. That's, I mean, if you make them, you're better off, right? If you make them, you're better off than developing them. Well, the same thing, make or develop, yeah. I mean, when I say make, I mean end-to-end -end make. I don't mean just, like, get a design from one country. You're always better off doing something end-to-end. -end. If you're doing sort of parts of the supply chain, you get a problem, which is what happened in um, with, with the pandemic. Remember, we got our, we had no face masks, we had no medicines. My mum hasn't been able to get a heart medicine for three months because the, the government, in all its wisdom, whatever it did, and the pharmaceutical companies in all their wisdom, made generics, but the generics don't work. And they're the same pills according to the doctor, but they don't actually work, and the doctor said they don't work. So my mum can't get a heart med. And, um, Sorry, Susie, can you yeah, be quiet? Yeah, yeah, it's a bit distracting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so I'll, I'll go along a bit. Uh, so we measure inputs, not outputs, and a lot of other stuff measures outputs, so patents, and that's a bit different. If you measure inputs, you can improve. If you measure outputs, you can't. So outputs are what you already did 10 years ago. So Silicon Valley can do well on outputs, but they can't do well on inputs as much as they used to. Silicon Valley should be the number one city in the world for innovation, but because their government is so incredibly incompetent, and bad across California, or across all the levels of government, but they, they're not, because they just they just keep spending money and nothing changes. The homeless problem doesn't go away, so it's getting worse. The um, problem, social problems are getting worse. If people just defecate in, in the street in, in, in San Francisco, you sit there and just walk out of the Hilton, there's 10,000 people in the conference and there's just people like lining up and having a, a defecation in the street. Um, it's, it's hard to explain how badly the governments that run California. That I, I heard there's even an app now people have started using where they can say, oh, there's someone did a number two here, don't go here. And 
Yeah, it probably is. I think I heard about that. Yeah. Maybe we got that. It's like it's an app where it will show like where people have done their business. It, it's, so, it's sort of it's yeah. sort of like they don't. What it is is it's like they've kind of built a layer over top of it and don't care. Because it was called number twos. Yeah. 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 Number twos. Yeah. yeah. It's a good idea though. Really. Um, okay. So we, we've got 162 indicators, and we'll get to that. And they're quantitative. Uh, we use an algorithm. And we designed this in, I designed a lot of 2011, 2012, but other people helping. And uh, yeah, we have, I have a list of indicators here. If you'd like to see, we can pass them around. But you'll ask me a lot of questions once you get them. <laughs> a list of indicators. <laughs> yeah. So I'll pass them around and have a look. But I'll, I'll show the slides first. So before you ask the questions, just. Um, uh, okay. So. This is just an inverted pyramid for the sake of not using a diagram that everybody else uses. Uh, 800 data points and it goes into this indicators and benchmarks and factors. So it sort of reduces down. So what we talk about publicly is the factors and underneath is all this data. And even if we don't have data, we have ways of, um, of doing that. So not quite enough for everybody, so just pass around as, as best you can. Uh, so these are some of the benchmarks, just share them around, uh, and these are the areas for going to innovation. Does anybody have, so the main ones people think of is technology, right? You think of that when you think of innovation. Industry, tourism people don't think about, but it's quite important. Economics people think about, mobility means public transport mostly, like uh, there's a correlation between public transport and innovation normally, that if you have more public transport, you tend to be more innovative. That's maybe because they need the public transport, I'm not quite sure why, but there tends to be. And these are all areas that, that could have innovation in them. Does anybody have a gut reaction to that? Just, just somebody asked a question about indicators. I just, um, I just want to get some idea of the model. So um, you're, you're building a model with a bunch of features, and um, some of these features seem like they should be weighted more heavily. Yes, they are. So could you do that? Yes. <coughs> yeah. So, uh, and not all. So I'm not going to say what's weighted heavily. Mostly, except to say that the, the, the section in the middle does weight very heavily. So technology is a very heavy weighting. Yes, yeah. and I can imagine that people would assume that transportation would be heavily weighted. And transportation is very heavily weighted. So it's actually 13 or 14, depending on what you call transport indicators. So what? that includes scooters. Scooters are part of it too, like right. the lime scooters. Yeah. How do you um, evaluate the weighting group? Uh, we do that through a proprietary method to discuss everything and we figure it all out. But basically we look at what's a trend at the current time and what's not. So during a pandemic, I'll give you an example. Uh, at the current time, digital skills or working from home were very important. So if you could work from home from that place, that would weight more heavily. Whereas in normal time, digital is not so important. So if you go back 10 years, digital wasn't that important, and now digital is really important. Yeah. So there's like a, we do, a, we have a proprietary method. Everybody who does an index basically has a proprietary method because at the end of the day, it's always a bunch of people sitting around discussing it. The economists the same, nurses is the same, they're all the same. So ours, we have a, a mathematical way, but we describe it uh, and we, we have weightings, but we don't disclose the weightings because then otherwise people try to game it. And so we don't want anybody gaming it. We just talk in general. At the moment, uh, this is not, government policy is all over here, startups, but startups are largely irrelevant now. Um, and public safety, that's gone through the roof. Uh, so there's certain things where government might be focusing on, but it's not actually what's important at the moment. And then you get different governments focusing on different things. So yeah. If they're a customer, yes. If they're not, no. Um, we provide, we put up and we created a, because we don't have a huge budget. So if we were, so the thing is, what people will pay for is not what's actually helpful to human beings. So generally speaking, <laughs> a government will pay for something or a corporation will pay for something that's not necessarily that helpful, you know what I mean? and they'll, they won't pay for something which is sometimes. Not every government, like we did some good work for the Singapore government uh, in the past, and they were 
concerned about helping people, but sometimes it's more focused on a priority area that may or may not help the population, you know what I mean? So you often what you get paid for is not what is necessarily good to do in the sense that, that, that you know, it's not really, you know, it's not really correlated, it makes any sense, yeah? So yeah, but we do provide, we, we now have set up a newsletter and that's the way we're doing it. So there is, you, at the end of this, there's a sub stack and you can subscribe to the sub stack and we're providing free advice on the sub stack with the hope that the governments will then engage us to actually give them advice. And we have given advice to the government of the Emirates, for example, and they did a lot of things. They, they helped, they improved a lot of things in their society. So, um, yeah, and we've given advice to some governments here in Australia. Uh, we, we don't talk about exactly who we advise, but we did advise some of the governments. So, yeah, and they did improve some things. And Brisbane actually does a pretty good job on quite a few things. The council here is actually pretty proactive and pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. How did you? What's the process for selecting these these things in the sort of in in, in your index? Um, I can I, I think you put it up there and you go okay I can make a story of why it's in there. Yeah. But how do you select things? So so the the process hasn't really changed since two thousand and nine. So originally there were forty two indicators, and then that was basically quite subjective and based on what everybody else's research did. And then in 2009, 2010, there were 162 indicators and they've changed about 5% a year. But generally speaking, they were selected based on all the papers and theories that were floating around about innovation and knowledge cities. So there's a guy called Nikos Komonos, who, uh, another guy called Xavier Carrillo. They're all professors in, in various different institutions and the OECD staff and the UN staff. And so basically we just went through every single paper we could find and every single book we could find and sort of pulled it into something. So there's, so for example, the idea of startups as innovation, I don't remember where that exactly came from, I'd have to check the papers, but there was some stuff around capital and that came from the World Bank, uh, a guy called Hernando de Soto, and he, he, he won a lot of prizes and he wrote a good book on the mystery of capital, explained it well. So all of it traces back to some form of theory or policy well, stuff. It comes from a paper that you then your your group work to get that these are important things and then they have yeah exactly the we prioritise a bunch of papers basically yeah. and, and books yeah um, having so many indicators in this like conflict um, the consolidating them wouldn't that mean that actually the importance of the individual indicators is basically almost zero ah uh, diluted by the sheer number of but but, of but isn't that reality yeah, because then, I just know because I did some research years ago into multi criteria, multi criteria decision analysis, and this is the same problem. You know, the more criteria you have, the less important the individual criteria for the decision. And that's yes, but that, that's what we want because the yeah. reason being is the reason why you want that is if you have too fewer indicators, they seem too important, and if they change them, in reality, it won't change much. But isn't it a little bit like with the cities? You say there's an optimum, you know, four million people. If you have too many. Good if you have we think this is the optimum, we don't think it's not. So the reason why is because, I take the point, multivariate analysis, I gotcha. But it's just that, what I'm saying is that if you have too fewer indicators, you give the impression that changing one indicator gives too much power. And so it's very easy to write a theory about it, but it's very difficult. It's wrong to say that if you improve one indicator. So to improve, you have to improve a cluster of indicators. So it's designed so cities can't just do a policy and say, hey, I, I improved our public transport by create like the Andrews government, let's say. They put public service or police officers on the trains. This gives them a one point bump, a one indicator. And that's all it should give them because if so it gives them, yeah. So in terms of, but on the other hand, you have quite a few internet related indicators like internet uses, Wi-Fi, yeah. all the time, so, so wouldn't the city be tempted to focus sort of, you know, one, how do you call it, one slap, kill seven, like where you you do an effort and you actually simultaneously improve on several sort of they, they can't redundant. it's not it's designed they can't they cannot do that there's no way to fake it and improve you can't you have to like if you improved you can't improve seven technology indicators at the same time with one policy you can only improve with one policy two or three indicators at most so it's designed so you have to do a cluster of policies 
to improve. So Singapore, over a long time, have done a cluster of things to make their society uh, with a good transport system, public gardens, all these sorts of things, good technology. Now, would I, do I like Singapore to live in? No, but that's just my opinion. It's not about innovation. So, um, you know, so that's the thing. But it, I'll tell you, I, I'm happy to answer a bit more detail about it. I know where you're coming from, but yes, I'm happy to. Yeah. yeah. Oh, um, do you think, um, I was talking to someone, would have been in about 2018, and he told me something I found quite fascinating. He said that, I think he said that they have done research and studies into this that roughly about four, like 400,000 is like kind of the perfect place for somewhere to live because he said at that size you've got uh, like all essential services, um, but it's also uh, just big enough that you will have a, <clears throat> for example, a pretty good um, like arts and cultural scene. You'll probably have, you know, a museum and art gallery. You'll have like social yeah, groups. I, I, and art I, I, yeah. Do, do you think there's some? Yes. There's, to that? So there's definitely an, there's two bands. There's like a four million city, mm. and then it's a uh, two hundred thousand to five hundred thousand up to 800,000 uh, town slash small city. Mm. And the sweet spot might be around 400, but that's too defined because it depends on the city. Mm. And depends on how, how space down is. So the gentleman in the black shirt had the next one. Yeah. Um, sort of a little bit further from that question before, I completely get why you don't want to disclose how much you're waiting individual metrics by, but would you feel comfortable disclosing sort of the difference between those? Are you waiting something sort of two times heavier or? Uh, so, I, they're, 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 let's put it this way, some things have very little weighting out of the 163 today at all. So let's say we had an indicator called littering. Mm. Littering never, has never received a high degree of weighting. The reason why littering matters is when, uh, so let's say you have a conference mm. and people go to Paris. Who likes Paris? Who loves Paris? Uh, or just, okay, show of hands, put them up a bit high so I can see who really likes Paris. Okay, who thinks Paris is not a very nice city? <laughs> okay. Generally, the reason, number one reason why people don't like Paris is, what do they say? It's dirty. Is that fair? Yeah. And crime. Crime, okay, dirty and crime, okay. So what is, the, what is their perception of dirty? It's McDonald's wrappers on the street. It's littering, it's peeing in the streets, it's all that stuff. So in effect, littering matters. And if you were to start, so if you have a negative opinion of Paris, what's the chance you're gonna start a business there? Or what's the chance you're gonna go there and create relationships with them? It's slimmer, right? What do people say about Singapore? It's clean. To some people that matters. To some of you it does. And then some of you would say, oh, it's antiseptic. So the criticism, of, the, the, the criticism and the praise of Singapore are the same. It's clean, it's antiseptic. It's the same thing. It's just you, you don't like antiseptic and you, you, like, you like clean. So depending on what you value, that determines. So we're not trying to get into people's value judgments. We're saying littering matters. Does it matter as much as um, uh, all those technology indicators? No, no way, Jose. But it still, if they cleaned up the city, it would increase the number of relationships they had. So littering is a very low value indicator, and say startups have historically been a very high value indicator. But the problem is now that governments all have startup policies. So is there any advantage in any particular place? Like London's got a great startup scene. The government's buying sex startups in London apparently. Would you believe that? That's what they're doing. Um, on that, how do you measure the, the actual benefit? So I can imagine that putting in a train line in one city and another train in another city, they could have way more benefit in city A than it has in benefit C. We, 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 we can't, we can't, because okay. we can't really measure it because it's, it would be too complicated, but you could do it as an exercise, separate from the index. But we would say that the benefit would be equal just for the sake of the argument. We couldn't really, we couldn't do that. I mean, and that um, might account for some of the what may appear to be strange cities on the list. But your your strange cities list, everyone's strange cities list will be different. That's the oh, problem. For sure. But yeah. but um, what's a strange city? Well, Los Angeles. Okay, Los Angeles has the biggest technology and media and arts industry in the world, and most of, most of San Francisco is moving a lot across there. Yeah. That's why they're skewed. Okay. But they are a failed. I hate Los Angeles. I would never live in Los Angeles. I, I don't want to visit and, Los and Angeles. Right, because yeah. you, you tend to sort of think, I think about things like um, transportation. I yeah. mean, Los Angeles is a horrible place. Yeah, so, so what it is, is that there's strengths. So some cities are strong in transport and they get a high ranking. 
but this city over here is strong in meter and arc. So you have to put them in balance. So a strength in one or a strength in the other, but you don't, you can't be strong in everything. So you, you don't ever get a perfect city. You just get which set of fleas the city's got that you can live with. But you, to get high on the list, you would have to be perfect. No, you can't be perfect. No, you can't be perfect, but you, I assume you'd have to be high on a lot of the things that are weighted high. Yes, but you can't, you can't ever be high on everything. So in other words, ours, ours is a bit different to the others. The other ones assume that there's a perfect city in the world and we can just emulate it. So all those other rankings, they're assuming there's perfection. Is there perfection? <coughs> Anybody tell me? Anybody found perfect yet? Oh, you're gonna answer the question about perfection or ask something else. <laughs> I would like to give you my view on that. Okay. I would say that you've only got a limited pool of creativity yeah. and then therefore you can't match everything perfectly in every department. Yeah, you, you, can't, you can't be perfect. And the thing is, the strength is the weakness. So Singapore is clean, but it's antiseptic. So who, who here likes a clean city? Can we get a show of hands? Okay, so that's about 60% of you. Who, who, who thinks Singapore is too antiseptic or doesn't like it? Okay, you got a couple? So, okay, so usually speaking, some people value clean. So I love Paris. I would live in Paris in a heartbeat. But I wouldn't try to go to a doctor's appointment in Paris. It's impossible. Because you've got to go down the metro, there'll be a strike, the metro will be broken, there'll be some other problem. There'll be, the butchers will be on strike. The train driver will be early because he gets a slightly greater part. I mean, train drivers are early in Paris because of some reason, or they're late. Or you end up in a train station like I did, where there's a bunch of people who look like they're gonna rob you, and you have to get an Uber, but there's no Ubers and your phone's dead. So you have to, you have to get, and get a train back to where you came from and then get a taxi and pay 60 euros to get to safety. That's, that's the sort of stuff that happens in Paris. Paris is an absolute, Crazy place. We haven't it's got strike every day. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah, it's it's crazy. Striking enough, but we haven't yeah. got struck every day. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's obviously a lot of talk about waiting, yeah. uh, and all the conditions sort of close off the methods for waiting everything. I guess more of a look overall. Do you do you have more of a democratic process for figuring out those waitings, or is it really statistical, like through but there statistical is, there analysis? Is, there is no de democrat. I mean, there is no way of having a democratic process because always a few people decide. You can't. No, well, you, you have a, you know, for MCA, for example, something yeah. simple, we have people sitting around a table, what do I think this is weighted, and this is weighted point two. We do that, like, yeah. yeah. We, so we basically we basically have, yeah, analysts sitting around yeah. and okay. discussing it, yeah. Cool. yeah. Cool. But it's based it's based on, uh, an ana on other people's writings, or, or so, so let's say there was a paper or something written about, so there's a link between, um, okay, there's a link between diplomacy and trade, yeah, which is well recognised. And so if you have some form of diplomacy, where Austrade, for example, then that will increase innovation. And if a country doesn't have that, it will tend to decrease innovation because Austrade make relationships. They might not know what they do and you can't measure it, but there's been some sort of suggested link. So we would, yeah, that's, that's so, so people would bring that stuff in and we would sort of talk about it. Um, but it, it, it's, it's kind of developed over time and so most of it doesn't need, so whatever was developed in 2009, unless it's changed, will still be there. But the diplomacy link would be an old one, but the startups one would have changed totally because the, yeah, so the weighting's kind of, it's always gonna be a final uh, decision, but it comes from papers and books and, and stuff. It doesn't really come from the internet because the problem with the internet news articles is they're very, what your phone shows you is what you think is right, and you're trying to not do that. You're trying not to have confirmation bias. So you're trying to avoid that. So for example, I don't really like um, New York, but all our data says New York's important, so it's there, but I don't like New York. I would, if you ask me to live in New York, I'd say you have to pay me a lot of money to live there, and I would never live there. But I don't like it, but it's still <coughs> fine with me, yeah? Yeah, okay. Just a quick question. Yep. Sorry, I haven't seen your list of criteria. Yep. Oh. How high do you trust? And corruption. Right. Yes, yeah, so that's a big one actually, but it's indirect. So there is there is um I think I've got another leak. Oh you didn't get one. Oh my point out. <laughs> Pass over a list of indicators over this way. One is one indicator. Okay. Just to ask while I hand it to you, yep. is there any uh, priority to the indicators or well, is it sort of random? Uh, so there is a weighting, as I said. So I'll just give you a general consensus. These ones in the middle are the most heavily weighted. No, this is the, sorry, yeah. it's the list itself. Oh no, it's just the order, it's ordered by industry. Ordered by industry. Yeah, so there's no, the, the indicated list is just random. Yeah. Right. 
And it's an Excel spreadsheet, so it can be sorted any way. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, last question. Or the last the structure, I was wondering how much sort of local feedback comes into it, how like personal satisfaction with public transport, or are you just sort of going ah. to hard metrics? Okay, so personal or satisfaction or comes into service delivery mm -hmm. on public transport. It's not a big factor because it's very subjective, and the problem is, depending on who does the survey, yeah. it varies a heck of a lot. So the government will say it's 95%, Meanwhile, the, the trains are being run, are just falling apart. So the problem is the data is really wonky. Yeah. Last question. Yeah. I'm not sure to focus because we at the beginning, but yeah. if you mind summarising again, what does it mean to be more innovative or to score higher on this? Analysis? Okay. So in general, it means to be balanced. So you can't get perfect, you can only get balanced. Not really, but it correlates to economic growth and it correlates to people sort of moving there or some other thing. So it generally correlates to a sort of a reputation and that, and GDP is the other one. So it does correlate to somewhat to GDP. But we have to, the problem is when we started it, we had, we didn't, there was no data. So 2009, 2010, you couldn't get city data to save yourself. So we had to create city data when it didn't exist. And there is no deposit worldwide depository or government council on city data. And on top of that, if there was, they couldn't agree on it. And on top of that, if they did agree on it, they would skew it so they favoured themselves. So in other words, the, the Pakistani government and the Singapore government, the Pakistani government, Singapore government, the Indian government, all had a fight over how you measure telecoms. Because one of them, so they can't agree on an indicator to measure telecoms. So good luck having a world council on city data. It's never gonna happen because they just, they could never agree. So that's the thing. So when we started, we didn't have all the data. So we create, we went on relationships and we had to go sort of build it over time. And that's it, because it wasn't data. And now we think we've sort of drawn correlations to GDP and things like that. So we'll probably publish something on it shortly. Yeah. Yeah, back to the same question. I'm uh, struggling. Last question. You, I got to yeah, I'm struggling to, to actually understand what the, uh, your definition of innovation. Yeah. It's very different to my understanding of is a, a resolution to a problem in a, a, a completely different way to what it already exists. That's really my own that's, doing that's, my own research. Yeah. That's based on social innovation, transformative innovation, technology. But that's really not different. So it's a resolution to a problem. Yes. Okay. So but it's how can you define it within the city? So are we saying that actually Tokyo has better ways of resolving problems than London? Yeah, but so but who defines what a problem is? Who well, sets the list of problems? That's right. It's a, it, it has to be like a social problem, like a community problem. Yeah, but who says it's a problem? Well, the people, the stakeholders. But no, but the people well, don't. In this case, is you or your company or you're uh, deciding what it is? Because I'm relating also to these other uh, questions about uh, indicators. Yeah. And there doesn't seem to be any kind of um, social impact or environmental impact. Okay, so there's a bit, ah, too, many, there's a bit too many parts to that question, so I have to yeah. go back to your first part. Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay, so. Your definition is one definition of innovation, which is a, is a resolution to a problem. Well, it's not my definition, it's based on... But it's one of the... the research one research. I'm saying yeah. is yeah. multiple definitions of innovation. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, structuring change is just... It is implied that there is a problem, but there also could be an opportunity. Yeah. So a problem or an opportunity. Yeah. Right. So we've just omitted the paragraph which says problem or opportunity. Yeah. Right, but once you have a problem or opportunity, you have to have a structured response to it, correct? Yeah, well, and if you have to, it could be. Yeah, you, well, if you don't have a structured yeah. response, you couldn't yeah. change it. Yeah. And then if you have a structured response, then it has to benefit someone for it to be actually successful. Like it has to have benefit to the community or benefit to the, to the business or the government or someone. Well, we got it, yes. Sir. Okay, yeah, so your definition is not that different. It's just a matter of, we've just omitted the word problem or opportunity because the problem is, a problem is a negative way of looking at it, an opportunity is a positive way, yeah. but the two are, we would say there's more opportunities and less problems, but the problem with using that definition is we would get stuck in arguing about it. So, right. yeah, so it's the similar, it's a really not that much difference in the definition. Okay, but just one small point. Yeah. So for something to be innovative, that's, it have to be completely new and creative? No. Or, or could it be, no, so it's just, new to the environment. Yeah, so if, if, for example, you took the ideas of Japanese uh, solutions, something that was solved a problem in Japan, yeah. you could. Now, so the Australian, uh, the Middle Eastern governments, they took ideas from um, Australia to reduce the road toll. Mm. Now, those ideas are new in the Middle East, 
but old in Australia. And so there's nothing wrong with that. So that's the other problem with a lot of innovation definitions. They say it has to be new, but it doesn't have to be new. It just has to be new to the context, which I think is where you're going. So yes, I, that's right. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just I'm going to move on for a little bit, just to otherwise I'll get talk, talk, talk. Okay, but we'll probably end up with the same questions anyway, right? Yeah. <laughs> but they're really good questions, and you're really keeping me on my toes, so I can I've got to think exactly how to answer them, and I'm going to get that recording so I can put them in a statement, and I'm going to use your definition. Argument somewhere in that no point. Is, uh, consensus, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. consensus, I don't yeah, believe yeah, in yeah. Okay, but anyway, let's just say I'm going to take that and yeah. use it somehow. It would be very interesting. Okay. So, uh, CD select indicators we're interested in and their benchmark against. So this might answer your questions in a roundabout way. So, this is actually this is a wrong slide, so it shouldn't be in there. Yeah, that's not actually. That's, that's a slide for another context that we're selecting. Okay. So, this is about <laughs> Brisbane itself. So Brisbane ranks globally about the top 10% in its five year average and about 8% during COVID, yeah? Now, there's some subjectivity in that, right? So I'll explain to answer a little bit about the questions about city ranking. So some cities uh, vary a lot, depending on how you change the indicators. Some cities, they will go up a lot, they'll go down a lot, and they jump around. Um, now, Singapore very rarely ever varies. Singapore consistently is around the fifth in the world. It doesn't matter how we weight the indicators, it doesn't matter what we do, Singapore stays where it is. Might go down to 17, might go up to four. Just sits there, steady as a rock. Seoul is re relatively steady too. Very good, very well run city. Steady as a rock. Good transport system, well balanced, right. Tokyo at the moment sitting quite steady at the very top. The only thing weakening them is some of their mixed up border measures. So some cities just are like rocks, they just sit there. They never move much. You can, you can change the weightings, you can change the indicators, but they never move. Other cities, depending on how you weight things, move up and down. And those cities tend to be the cities that people don't consider as globally important. So they're the cities that people go, why are they on the list? You know, they move up and down a lot. You know? But the cities that, like New York, uh, Seoul, London, London and Paris, no matter how we do it, they, they might go down to, 21, they might go up to nine, but you, they're really, they're all in a range. Like London and Paris, they stick. So basically, if you didn't know anything and you really wanted to create an idea, move to London, set up your idea, probably work. It's got more chance of working there than if you move to Reykjavik. So that's sort of what I'm saying is that the more chance of you doing innovation in London, more chance you'll meet the people at a conference, more chance you'll form a relationship with universities, more chance you'll find capital, more chance you'll create a startup, more chance. So London and Paris, now if you had to choose between London and Paris, do you speak French? If you speak French, go to Paris. If you speak English, go to London. And so each of the cities sort of have that. Barcelona, if you speak Spanish, go to Barcelona. Best city in the world for Spanish speakers. Madrid would be close. So, that like the trend in the major cities is significant, right? Because it's Yeah. Not commercialised, but can, can make them grow, yeah. And I think, actually, it's really good you mention that, because I think it would probably be beneficial to put that as a slide at the beginning. That would be really helpful. Yeah. If, if, that's, that's, the, if that's the help we measure measuring. Yeah, well, that's basically what we are measuring, but it's, 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 um, it's not, it can't be quantified as an output, that's a problem, but yeah. How do you then decide, like, you go to these areas and you do it? Sorry? How do you decide what weighting to give it? Is that like, how it's going to impact? Like, Sorry? I did not hear the whole question. Like you said before, you decided that wheeling uh, should be an example. Yeah. And then you even gave an example of going to um, LA before yeah. it ever came from the street. Yeah. But then we had an example of it never came from the street. There actually had an innovative solution to that problem. <laughs> well, I, 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 I wouldn't call that an innovative solution. I'd say it's an interesting solution. But I would say <laughs> a desperate solution. Yeah. I guess I'm just wondering, like, Well, it, the problem is if you too tightly define the output, you'll just get cities that don't people, you'll get an artificial list, and that's the problem. So what would you tie it to, patents? You can't tie it to patents, because patents don't correlate really to innovation. You could tie it to GDP, but some people argue GDP is not the best thing. What I would say is there's loose correlations to other, other things. So there's loose correlations or tight correlations, but you can't, if you precisely formularize it, you will get a perfect list, 
that's not really realistic. So in other words, if you make it a precise relationship, exactly according to a formula, yes, it will look great on paper, and it'll be a great theory, but it's not going to be practical. And that's the bit hot here, isn't it? Um, yeah. Um, did you finish your thought, Brendan? Yeah, I think so, yeah. I'll, I'll come back yeah, to it again, probably. I, I just had a question. Uh, do you have any kind of questionnaire for all of those 100 plus indicators where someone can arrange how important this indicator is for him or her? I, I'd, love, I'd love to do that, yes. yes and then just based on that, you just have the filter of, of the cities that might be appropriate for you to just have a look on or whatever? That's what we'd love to do. We just don't have funding to do it. That's the problem. So the problem is no one will pay us to do it, but we would love to do that. In fact, I will, I will give you 10 bucks for that. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can do it. We have actually have all the data in a model and we can actually do it very quickly. Exactly. That's why I, I but the, <laughs> the, problem, the, problem, the problem is the, co the problem is no one pays for anything that's socially beneficial like that. But we would love to, basically, the idea is to set it up in a way that you can make your own ranking. I'm just so sorry to interrupt you, yeah. but like, I just came Your to definition of innovation, basically. I just came to Brisbane really pretty recently, and while I was choosing which city in Australia I was choosing, I was looking for some kind of that kind of indicators on Wikipedia, and yeah. so ever, like websites of 20 more sunniest city in the world, whatever. And it was super like, clunky and hard to find the right in the, like data for indicators that I. Like, it's very difficult about. to find city data. So yeah. I think like the funding idea is quite like really weird for me that you can you have a hard time finding it because even it, as an app would be like. Yeah, the, the problem is getting someone to pay for it, and the, the thing is when I'm going around to get, ask people what, to sort of explain that to people when I was in Silicon Valley and all that. They're, they're like, there's nobody will pay for it. So companies won't pay for it. People might pay for it at like five bucks a hit, but you'd have to sell a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And people can get stuff for free. And they're like, no, I'll get that for free. And then it won't be very good. So you have to get a lot of people paying five bucks a hit. Um, but we will get into that in our newsletter. So you can always uh, subscribe to that, but that's a, it's not that cheap either. So the impact of the for someone yeah. to do this when you see it. Yeah, so we would love to actually build that. We would, I really would, but I just I need someone to fund it. So what, what did you ask a question? Yeah, um, you said the weight balance for big cities is four million. Yeah. Uh, how do you deal with migration? Is it the people who still come in yeah. um, in the city, like Brisbane, for example, who probably is three and a half, you probably get four by, yeah. by the Olympics. How do you deal with more migration? Do you just put the price up to discourage people to come and live in the city, or you build around the suburbs? How do you deal with more migration, obviously? that would break up the balance of four million. Okay, so I'm not I'm not saying that four million is the only solution, but uh, no, that's a very complicated question and probably, yeah, sorry, no, okay. yeah, you know, it's a very good question, but it's just that it's not really possible to answer it because uh, it would depend on the city and then it would depend on the level of density in the city already and it would depend on whether they had good public transport or not to get to the outer suburbs. And maybe if you had a city of five, so Melbourne, for example, what they should do, and they should have done, was built up Geelong. Right. So they should create a second city called Geelong with one million and not overpopulate Melbourne where they don't have the infrastructure for five million. They should not fence off the whole CBD uh, with yeah. badly designed tram yeah, stops. Yeah. Yeah. So basically they made a mess of Melbourne and they, they, they're continuing to make a mess of it. Yes. Now, so we actually have a measure that measures the scientific and technical measure of innovation which we do for clients. Okay. So we have one that would meet your scientific requirement for innovation, uh -huh. and that, that's a, a particularly related to what we call technical and scientific innovation, and we sell that to other people. Um, and that's a very narrow, which includes scientists, engineers, patents, all those sorts of things. But we say this is not the conditions for innovation, this is measuring more what you would call a hard innovation, and then you're, you get the, the things like the, the usual cities that, that have those strengths, research strengths, and that going to the top. Uh, so, I think so, like, 
venture capital dot com. We've got venture capital in there, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So venture capital is under startups, yeah. So under growth funding. So why do you have a city that, that needs to be, well, what you do, the problem with a lot of the data in the world, it's all national, and the main problem with a lot of scientific research is the data is national, and the big problem with that is that um, when you deal with national data, how different is Brisbane from, say, Hobart? And how different is Hobart from, say, Wagga Wagga? And how different is Wagga Wagga from, say, uh, you know, one of those desert, desert towns out in the middle of the Alice. So if you're measuring Australian data, there is really no point. Because Australia's too big a country, you should never use national data to measure anything. It's just too, it makes no sense. So when you hear national rankings, it doesn't make a lot of sense, because if you live in Brisbane, that's very different. Is anybody from a country town? Okay, country town, yeah. And okay. okay. Who's lived in a small place before? Go on here, anybody lived in a small place? Okay. Aren't they very, they have no amenities at all. So if you're comparing data about things, even life expectancy, infant mortality. So if you live in a regional area, your life expectancy drops generally, because you're more likely to die if you have an injury, and uh, infant mortality rises generally. Generally, I can't say that's 100% true, but, but you, infant mortality rates will rise because you haven't got a hospital within 90 minutes or something. So you have to fly the baby to, if you're in some parts of Queensland, you have to fly the baby who's got turning blue to a, a hospital because there's nobody to deal with the baby, but then your infant mortality rises. So to say national infant mortality doesn't make sense, but to say city infant mortality makes more sense. Anyway, so it makes more sense to think of the world as cities, because you fly to a city, you go there on holiday, you go there for work. It doesn't make sense to think of the world as nations. Okay, so small cities around Brisbane. So I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit here. Um, so this is a, this is just getting into Queensland now. Brisbane does pretty well and continues to improve. Gold Coast is doing pretty well, relatively, not anywhere near Brisbane. But it has a thing called Hoka, has anybody been there? The arts precinct, pretty good. So that gives them a boost on a few indicators. So if you build an arts precinct, you get a pretty good boost. Uh, <laughs> that's a trick you can use. Uh, you can do a Beijing bit, move all their corporations to file their results in, um, Beijing, so that Fortune 500 companies all go up. You know, you can do that. Uh, Cairns uh, is a good. It's got a cultural centre and it's got some pretty good stuff happening. Sunshine Coast is going to join as a satellite to Brisbane, so eventually that will become a city centre on Maroochydore, where I live. And Townsville will eventually become a manufacturing hub, maybe. Don't know. Not sure about that, but um, very interesting. And so these are the Australian cities just there. Uh, the ones that the ones that Brisbane Sydney goes up and down like a yo-yo within within a band. It's not normally that high. It's around ten. Melbourne's around ten as well. Melbourne's normally ahead of Sydney. Brisbane is just keep, is gradually climbing every year a few points. Perth is gradually climbing every year a few points. Canberra is an outlier because a lot of data gets filed through Canberra. So as a result of the fact that Canberra is in the capital of Australia, capitals are one result you have to ignore a little bit because they tend to get some sort of favouritism, like Washington DC and Canberra are a bit too highly ranked. Um, Adelaide, roughly about where it is. Gold Coast going up. These ones down the bottom, they jump around. Newcastle's got a very good government policy on smart cities and stuff that helps a bit, but they're still taking a while. Um, Wollongong, and the rest all just sort of sit there. Um, and these ones are normally higher ranked without COVID. So these all suffered under, under the COVID rules, but they're, they're suffering as quantified as they move down a bit. Um, but, but they will go back up again. So that's the, uh, the list sort of thing. And um, that's pretty much it. Now they're gonna change this year. I'm gonna skip that and go ahead. Okay, so this is an important point to your credibility about things and also to the point of how it works. So this is a little bit, some of this, somebody put in the wrong slide, slide part of it, but more or less it's, uh, the whole thing is that you can't manipulate it easily, and that's the trick. So you have to do well across a whole range of different indicators, and you can't get a perfect score in every indicator. So a lot of the models out there, they're based on the idea you can have a perfect city. The perfect city is Luxembourg, and everybody copies that. Or the perfect city is, um, is say, Vienna, and then everybody copies that. But you cannot have a perfect city. There is no perfect city. 
All you can do is have a city that's slightly less worse or slightly better than another city. You can't have perfect. So it's just like you might value one thing, you value another. Um, who, who thinks uh, startups are very important to a city? Just show of hands. Who likes startups? Okay. Pims. Okay. Pims. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And that's, that's the best answer actually. The pims because it does pay. Okay. Um, who thinks uh, coffee shops are important to a city? Talking about Dutch ones? <laughs> <laughs> no, not Dutch ones. No, 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 not Dutch ones. <laughs> well, that's actually the right answer. You didn't study economics, did you? <laughs> but, cause then I lived in the Netherlands. So. Oh, okay, right, right. Well, there's that, and there's I saw that. Australians trying to organise meetings and asking for a coffee shop with Dutch people. And right. Very confused looks. Yeah, I, I went into one of those coffee shops too. I had very nice fish there, though, I have to say. It was very good. It was the best fish I ever had perching little olive oil and yeah, wine. Okay, so basically, what's another uh, thing? Uh, who thinks uh, cars are very important to a city? Okay, who drove here? So you think cars are very important to a city? So people will answer a, people will answer a question based on what they think public, and that's the other thing with taking surveys and that of people to get your demo, democratic results, because the problem with that is people will answer a question according to what they think is the right thing to say and not according to uh, what they actually do. And that's the other thing, yeah? Well, I drove here, yep. and I don't think cars are very important, provided we have alternative transport. So yeah. you can have a good public transport system, it wouldn't have to be consistent. Like in Switzerland, you can even drop the satellite in little towns and stuff in 15 minutes if it's too big. Yeah, so Swiss, Swiss get a very good bump from their from their transport system uh, have other issues but yeah the, the transport system is excellent in some countries the only thing is you can't move a, a, a so in Melbourne I saw people moving a wardrobe on public transport and actually they three students moved a wardrobe and took the drawers out and moved it on public transport and the government doesn't realize that you can't so in Melbourne you have a problem you cannot get to a meeting by public transport by car or by Uber or by any method other than bicycle, but then you'll be sweaty. Um, you can't get to a meeting in 30 minutes or 40 minutes, three kilometres from the CBD. So you cannot. I live three kilometres from the CBD. If it's a, during the middle of the day, there's no way you can get from St Kilda Road to the city in under, unless you're very lucky, in under 30 minutes to a CBD destination. And so it's ridiculous, but you can get from a slightly outer part on the trains. If you live near a train station, you're blessed. As long as the, tra the Frankston line's not out, the Dandenong line's not out, the Belgrade line's not out, there's not an accident, somebody didn't jump onto the tracks. So every day it's a random lucky dip. So if you've got to get to a job interview, what do you do? You drive, but then it takes you 45 minutes because you've got to park. So I, I did this survey, 45 minutes and three kilometers in, in any time in the sort of busy period. Um, it's got one of the worst it's getting one of the worst air qualities in the world because they have no decent public transport. Yeah, it's the best in Australia. It's inadequate for the purpose of 5 million people. It's designed for 4 million people. So basically, they want to put more buses. That would just make the roads worse. So they have no idea, no plan, no nothing except the ring thing. It's just, the problem is government doesn't build enough public transport. But then on the other hand, public transport is very important. And some governments do an excellent job of it. And you know, Swiss, Singapore, they do very well. I just wanted to ask you, did, we, we keep coming back to the ranking, I think we're it's naturally very curious about it, but yeah. the, um, I wanted to ask about the difference between the lead and lag indicators. So, oh, I think, that's a good question. Yeah. So um, the leading indicators are the ones that provide the fertile soil and the lag are the number of patents coming out the other yes. side. So how, which have you included? Are they all leading indicators or um, how, how have you... Can okay, you so a lot of it's those? leading indicators, yes. Yeah. And then some of the lag indicators are included because they become a feedback loop. So if a city has a reputation for uh, patents, are um, measured a little bit in there indirectly, but patents are a, a, a feedback loop. So if a city has lots of patents, then or research papers or things like that, then that's a feedback loop. But then there's a lot of garbage research papers published now, so that's sort of. So there's a lot of people gaming things. So you've got this sort of. So you, you almost want to measure things that people don't think you're measuring, so that you don't have a better idea. Um, so yeah, a lot of it's lead indicators, it would be more on that. Okay. Um, speaking of ranking your speech on the ranking, is there, yeah. have you tried any sort of models of a school system from zero up? So you can see how they compete with each other or how far each of them are from each other? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah
we, we do, we, we don't, I'm not going to say, so we, underneath, we do what you say. Mm. So we have some, we basically have a mathematical thing that, that does, um, that uh, allows for the fact that it doesn't really matter if you're the best in the world, it only matters if you're better than the other city. And so that's sort of baked in. So in the underlying model, baked in is the idea that you don't have to be, it doesn't matter if one, say, so let's take a city with good public transport. Uh, what would be a good example? Uh, okay, Barcelona. Barcelona has pretty good transport, right? So it doesn't really matter if Barcelona and Portugal and Lisbon and Portugal, one of them's better than the other, as long as they're roughly comparable. So they would, but a city like Hobart, which only has buses, which is adequate maybe, uh, or has a, you know, a city with a token light rail, then that wouldn't do as well. And so it more cities fall into bands, if you like. And so we wouldn't necessarily care if one city's 10% better than another, but we care if it was 50% better. Yeah, okay, last question on this one. Oh, yeah. uh, and do you think sometimes the answer isn't always necessarily dump a ton of public transport somewhere? Because like, even if it is really good public transport, because well, Brisbane, for example, like, Often we can be described as a car dependent city, and yeah. I guess we are. Like, and I, I get a lot of public transport because I, yeah. I don't drive, but yeah. I, but I can see, but I've been getting it for a while, so I kind of, I can see its good side, and it, yeah. I can see it as being quite efficient and good quality. But yeah. I can see how if someone's like getting their car serviced and they can't drive for a week, and they've got to get public transport to work and stuff. That often I hear from those people they. Yes, yeah, so that's the public point. You have to weight everything. So we weight public transport very heavily. Mm -hmm. I've actually given up cars for quite long periods and used public transport. When I travel, I use mostly public transport. Mm -hmm. um, in some cities in Europe, that's possible. Uh, and, I, I, and all of the public service in Europe prefer long distance trains to flying. And that's certainly better for the environment. It's, it's depending on how you measure it, it's 10% of the pollution. So you're better off with the train. As long as you don't have to get a train and then just drive 100 kilometres around out of your way or something. But usually in Europe you don't have to. So trains are excellent in Europe compared to here, though Germans always complain about everything. Um, but yeah, trains are excellent. And are you German, are you? Uh, yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, we do complain. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's true though. You always get, so every time I go to Germany, they've got the best public transport. They've got this great ICE train. So I say to a German person, you know, this is a wonderful thing. And they say, yes, but it's five minutes late. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's kind of a compliment. So they say the German compliment is only genuine when it continues with a but. Yeah. Ah, yeah. yes, 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 okay. So this is a cultural thing. It's a little bit like Australians saying something's all good. A British person says, not bad, which means the same thing. And an American says, awesome, which means the same thing as an Australian or a British English, not bad. So yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's a sort of a cultural thing, but yeah, well, generally, I'm surprised because in Australia, has anybody tried to catch trains over, over between states here? Has anybody done that? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Never again. Yeah. It's horrible, isn't it? <laughs> do you realise we could run a train line for three to four hours between Melbourne and Sydney? If we could do that, it would be possible. Four hours if they messed it up. Three hours if they actually bought really good Japanese or some other German stuff uh, or European. Swiss. Swiss. God bless the Swiss for their trains. Um, but yeah, so anything that, that, um, that's really good, and we bought it and we put it in, we could actually have three to four hours between capitals. And I've worked on a project for that, a, a model for it, but nobody would fund it. Um, they funded a PDF instead, which was put out by a consulting firm that cost $600,000 for a PDF. The PDF got dumped and nobody ever read it. So we, we wanted to charge them a quarter of that, they funded the PDF. They didn't care because their friends ran the PDF consulting firm. So that's how it works. Mm -hmm. um, so unless I went and bought them drinks and took them to the cricket, I probably wouldn't have gotten there. Yeah, but, but look, um, the thing is, it's possible to get really good high-speed transport. But, sorry, I'm a little bit bitter about that if you probably picked that up. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna mention about a couple of things. So this is interesting cities right now. Miami has been going through the roof for some time, <laughs> continues to do so. It's got very high property prices, that holds it back. But it's got a very interesting scene going on there. Dallas Fort Worth also, uh, and it's a lot of people are migrating there. Austin is the older one of the lot. We picked up Austin in 2013, I think, 
I just, if you know South by Southwest, it's pretty popular. Adelaide is the center of film industry. Stockholm, Sweden has been doing well as the center of Spotify. Seoul is continuing to do very well. And if it doesn't get invaded by North Korea or end up in some sort of shooting war, it'll probably blow. We're not trying to be, we're trying not to be racist. In, we're trying to remove all the bias in the data, but it's very difficult. Um, and, but there's a lot of things in there, so uh, yeah. So there's cities that we consider hot or interesting. Uh, Tokyo obviously is on the top of the list, but that's kind of reached its peak, so it might continue for a while, but it's no longer hot. Tokyo, when we put it there, it was hot. Um, you could say Dubai is hot, but Dubai's got a lot of problems as well, so. So what's your favorite thing about, oh, what is your favorite thing about Brisbane? I'll just ask a few things. What's the favorite thing? Open space. Open space, okay. So we rank Brisbane number one in our algorithm for public spaces in the world out of 500 cities. Yeah. Pretty interesting thing. Okay, yep. Uh, re really nice parks and... Yeah, it's yeah, so the same thing. So yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the, we rank it number one in the world and, and Tokyo is like number two or three. Yeah, mm -hmm. what's another thing? It's safe. Yeah, it does rank very well on crime and when you say safe, you mean violent crime probably? Yeah? Okay, very low on violent crime cities that do very badly on violent crime tend to discourage people who are creative. So not it's again. very clean as well. Yeah, very, it is. Very clean. Yeah, very clean, yeah. What's another one? Universities. Yes, okay. University is pretty, yeah, it's got a lot of universities. Uh, QUT and the, the other ones, yeah. It's walkable. Who says that? Oh, thank you. Okay, a walkable, okay. Yeah. It's warm. Yes, okay, so climate, <laughs> climate's, climate's a funny one. The weather really makes, does make a difference. Funnily enough, there's some research that cold weather correlates to innovation more because people spend more time actually inside, um, but it's not entirely, like tropical doesn't correlate to innovation, but cold weather does a bit. But Brisbane's temperate and quite moderate sort of thing, so it's really quite nice if you don't mind a bit of humidity and stuff there. Yeah. Uh, wasn't the, the, sorry, no, okay, yeah. Another one? So I saw a hand out here somewhere, I didn't know where it came from. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, yeah, it's not, um, it doesn't take too long to get to more, like the outskirts and the more like quiet areas. Like so it's got good transport between the yeah. areas. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any more? Favourite thing? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Kind of like there's, there's quite a lot of international flavour in Brisbane. Yeah. Good. Yeah, right now. Yeah, also you can have uh, the, the countryside with Sanford, you can have the beach, you can have the tropical forest within yeah. 100 kilometres. Yeah. That's pretty unique. So do you think creative people would be attracted to all those things you said? Yeah, well, absolutely. Most people would, like parks. Okay, who values parks? Go ahead. Okay, so parks, a lot of create. who gets ideas when they sit at their cubicle? Who they get ideas at their cubicle? <laughs> <laughs> okay, who gets an idea when they go to a park? You go for a walk, you get an idea. So there's actually scientific research that you, if you go for a walk, you'll get more ideas. I mean, it's, it's not 100% clustered, you know, into every variable, but it's pretty reasonable that the idea is you go out and get research. And if you go back to artists, most of them went out and painted in plain air, right? So that gives them ideas, right? So who, are, who where is another place you get ideas? Shower. Shower, yes. <laughs> that, is, that is the number two, you just named the number two most popular place. I, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna add on to that the toilet, because that often happens. I've got a notepad next to the toilet. So <laughs> Right, and what's another one? Event. I think small <laughs> alleys or towns where you have a lot of boutique stores and coffee shops. Yes, and stuff. okay. So and I love Seoul for that, and Tokyo. Yes, so Seoul is great because they have the two-story, three-story restaurants, right? You go up to the third story and there's some weird restaurant on the yeah. third story. Um, yeah, so that, that's definitely something that Seoul has, and Tokyo has that too, and Osaka, Kobe, Kyoto, all of them. So they're all pretty good, right? And, and even... Uh, Hanoi has that, uh, you know, different, so there's little, like, Melbourne tried to build that with the laneways, mm. and they really did a great job. Then the government got very clever with the laneways and decided they were going to make them, like, preserve them instead of letting them evolve. Mm. And that's when you get into trouble, mm. you see. But yeah, so those places, so all those things are important. And if you were measuring innovation and eye vision rates, you should probably measure those things because that's where the ideas come from. Mm. If you sit, when you're in lockdown, and you're sitting in your cubicle or in your bed, you're not gonna get many ideas. So I agree, I would go out for a walk and I'll go to the whole city and get ideas. And that's where my ideas come from. Most of the stuff 
like creative stuff comes from that. So and access to finance is pretty. Oh, so that's higher. not idea generation, but that yeah, that's very important. Yeah. So uh, you mean so access to finance is to what? Well, to, to startups because yes. I'm I was in the, I'm retired now, but I was an accountant and a lot of my clients were startups, and that was one of their things. I mean, they could couldn't get off the ground because of finance. Yeah. That is, that is, we've got it listed as a series of indicators, but the problem is, that's the biggest problem, and that's why you end up in New York or London, because then you get in New York or London, you could go out to dinner, and the chances of you just accidentally meeting someone who mm. works in venture. So in New York- Angel finance. Yeah, so and, yeah. I, I, most of the times I've made you know, traditional, um, like a big movement in a project I've been working on has been someone accidentally said to me, so how I had met the high speed rail, uh, economist for that, the initial starting of that project was he phoned us up to ask us about an indicator. And so mm -hmm. I started talking to him, he said, oh, I want to build a high speed rail model. And so he was an economist and I said, okay, let's start. And so we started building a model based on a conversation that came about indicators. We had a cup of tea in the Sofitel in Melbourne and that's how we started building a high speed rail model. Yeah. So that, without that chance yeah. connection, you can't do it, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, and the biggest problem is if you're sitting in your home listening to Zoom meetings, it's very hard to form human connections. Mm. Mm. So this idea you can just stay home and be digital, eh, not really. I mean, you can mm. if you've got a really great network, but then your network's not really growing whilst you're being digital. Yeah. Who, who remembers the last seven people they spoke to on a Zoom call? But you remember, oh, you do, know, okay. <laughs> but you remember that most people remember more than people they meet. And not so much the Zoom calls, yeah. Was there one other question I saw somewhere? Oh, yeah. yeah. I just want to ask, um, wouldn't that be a bonus or a sort of walk called the walkability for the Netherlands, where you're a lot more likely to have those? Yes. Mm. And the walkability is an indicator, mm. yeah. Mm. So the, the idea of the accidental walk, has anybody heard of that? The mm. idea that the path, you should put the paths in the city based on where the paths in the snow are, because that's where people walk. So the idea is yes, and that accidental walk thing theory, yeah. So these are all things that people value. Ah, oh, so skip to it. So they're all things that people would say. And so they all correlate to the generation of ideas. And, and so this is an interesting few things. I'm gonna skip this a little bit. Uh, and with time. So this is where we, we, this is how our data, and this probably doesn't relate to you, but it's just that I, I haven't got another slide. So I'm just gonna put this, this is a client slide, but basically, uh, the data you get from Google is normally wrong, okay? So almost everything you just get in Google, you type in what's the population of a city, unless you know what the population should be, or you know a range, it could be wrong. They can say the population is 200,000, but they mean the inner city. They could say the population is 5 million, but uh, do they mean the urban area, do they mean the, the, pop, the metropolitan area? You don't know. So Google normally is not very accurate even on population. It's just not, unless you already have something to compare it to. So generally speaking, if there's no study or no list or so, no sort of underlying thing, you really can't just rely on Google as a sort of a test of anything. And it can be wrong on everything. It can be wrong on inflation, it can be wrong on, and it's biased. Google is extremely, exceedingly biased based on what the people that work there think should be the top result. So they, they skew it and they just bias the hell out of it. It's not, it's not what's most popular, it's what they think should be the top result in some categories. And that's basically how they do it. And it, it's just, you can see it if you go through a raw feed and if you go through Google. So then you can do boot camps, but that doesn't get any results. And then so what these, a lot of people in government get their results from these two, and they're both very good, but they're very expensive. How do you get a raw feed? Uh, well, you can go to other search engines and okay, look for them it. and look for things where they don't bias. Okay. So if you look at the results, uh, there's ways of doing it. There's like an experiment you can do, but it's a bit complicated, but then you can run like Google Parallels or something. Like DuckDuckGo? No, no, DuckDuckGo is it's using Google. still Google, yeah. Yeah, so, so what happens is that there are some small search engines that can be run as a parallel feed, like, and just to see what the, so like, they're like based on the old Google. Okay. Before they biased everything. What's one of them? I can't remember, but no. you can Google <laughs> you can Google, <laughs> you can Google, Google how to do it, okay. if you know what I mean. Okay. If you ask me later, I'll, 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 I'm going to do it as an experiment. But the again. word is raw feed, look up. No, it's not raw feed, it's just um, alternative search engines to Google, but all the smaller ones, Yeah. and the ones that nobody knows about. Okay. 
And basically you can run, what, what, I, what I did was I ran a parallel of about seven or 11 of them, and I looked at the results from Google and <coughs> these, and you get these vast gaps. Yeah. And then you realize how much Google influences yeah. you, like your YouTube algorithm. And then the other thing is they personalize your results. Yeah. So if you're in one country, you get a totally different result, because I, what I do is I switch countries all the time, because um, I go overseas or whatever, but I also switch countries where I'm searching. I use different search Googles. And if you're in Sweden, you get a different result than if you're in Australia. And so there's no, Google has different versions of everything. Mm. Um, and so it's very interesting, uh, yeah. Mm. And so anyway, this is what our data, we do the data about the cities. And this is, but it just compares to where government tends to get their data from statistics they have themselves. They have a thing called open data, but usually that contains things like parking spots and security cameras. It doesn't contain anything really useful. There's nothing much, if you go to an open data portal, often not that useful and that's you know, quite typical they don't have the they don't have access to the data or they don't want to fund it or they just people don't want to let go of the data so if you work in government and you have control of this data why would you give your colleagues access to it in order to let go of your power that's the, that's how it works in effect people can hold on to the data like this because they have power and yeah and sometimes they don't have the data uh, and that's because so the city of Melbourne is 200, is 120 to 200,000 people, depending on, let's say it's a small area, right? And daytime or nighttime economy or whatever, but it's a very small area. The actual Melbourne urban area is a series of councils. So there's no council that runs Melbourne. There's only the city of Melbourne and the state government. So there's nobody to go to for data about Melbourne. Because there is no Melbourne. Does that make sense? There's no central body that has data on Melbourne. There's only ABS data, which is often collected, but it's only relates to something. So, anyway. yeah, well, just quickly on that, is it yeah. true that someone's told me that Brisbane City Council is actually the Brisbane does have its own. Yeah, yeah. is it? Some, they told me that it's actually the largest single council in the world. Yeah, in terms of just like because there's no other place in the world that's got one council running the entire. I'm, I'm not sure it's the largest in the world because that might be subjective depending on how you define large, but mm. but uh, it is one of the biggest councils and has the most control. Mm. Whereas almost every other city, there's no there's no central body. Mm. So when you talk about uh, Paris, well they have all the arrondissements and that. They have a committee for Greater Paris. Mm. They have they have so Paris has so many different government departments at different levels that to say what Paris is is very difficult because there's actually multiple Paris's. Yeah. Um, yeah. A couple of these slides, I'm not, okay. I'm not gonna do that, okay. I'm gonna get to just a couple of interesting points. So what can government do about innovation? Government can create preconditions. That's what it can do. Governments can do this very well, or they can do it very badly, right? Um, the government that does it well would be something like Singapore have done quite well at this. Uh, Melbourne historically has done quite well, but especially under the Jeff Kennett period and post Jeff Kennett. Uh, but that's because the Victorian government control Melbourne, not the city of Melbourne. So uh, you can get good examples and then you can get bad examples. Brisbane does quite well. Uh, because it, once again, because of the cohesive council, right? Uh, what's the dark side? So government can also damage innovation. Lockdowns destroyed small businesses. They destroyed whole slaves of the economy, causing massive problems for a lot of people. Uh, this is very common in Melbourne. They, they really did destroy whole slabs of the CBD. And those businesses all created some value, maybe $4 million, $10 million in value. They would argue that's replaced by a large corporation. But that large corporation is like a sponge. And the, and the individual little businesses are of value. So if you want to create Tokyo or Seoul, you need those little individual businesses. If you destroy them, you can't replace them with one big behemoth that does the job. Because individuals vary. So all of you vary, right? All of you gave different answers to questions, right? So you all vary. Now, if I just take all of you and average you, and then create one entity to be all of you, and say, so call, call that a name, what's someone's name? I'm gonna say David over there. Okay, so da <laughs> David, so all of you become David, and I average all of you and I make you David. And once I made you an average of David, and then I manage you, the stats look the same. Hello David, how are we today? Would you like to, would you like to go to the park 
Or would you rather go to, would you, who likes Japanese food? Okay, who hates Japanese food? Anybody? Okay. Who, name a cuisine you hate. What sort of cuisine you think they don't like? Mexican. Mexican. Okay. British, okay. <laughs> David, there is a cuisine called British, it's called fish and chips, okay. Yeah. Yeah. David, J.B. Oliver doesn't count. Okay, David, today we're all going for British food. Followed by we're going to, we're all going to, uh, not to the art gallery, because some of you might like the art gallery, we're going to go to a death metal concert, because some of, apparently, on average, you all like death metal less than you hate jazz. So on average, we believe you want death metal. So today you're going to the approved death metal concert. On average, everybody in the room. And so the problem is average, at once, on average it can all look good, but once you get rid of those small businesses, they take 10 years to build. So Melbourne did a lot of damage to their small businesses. <coughs> Fortunately, entrepreneurs there are very flexible and there's always new migrants. So one of the big problems also is pot corruption. You mentioned corruption? Yeah. Corruption is really, really, really bad, but it takes a long time to be bad. It's just, uh, in Singapore, they got rid of corruption uh, under under the pre uh, former uh, leader of Singapore. And basically, yeah. Uh, the other thing is that during this period, politicians did quite well because they all owned shares, which they shouldn't do. Uh, it's a subject to legislation in the United States in stocks uh, and areas where they benefit. So there's a site called Quiverquant. If you've ever heard of that, anybody heard of that? It compares the shareholdings of US politicians to the things that they write legislation for. Oh, wow. Ah, yes. Well, so we the, need that. We, well, ours are, not, ours are not the worst. We don't have as bad of politicians in Australia, to be honest. But the US ones, some of them, yeah, they own shares in companies like, so they apparently bought shares in NVIDIA, then they wrote legislation to support NVIDIA. Yeah. So this corruption is very endemic and hard to track, but it damages because if they're making all this money over here, someone else is losing money over here. And it, it's, a, it's damaging. Corruption is a cancer. Mm. Uh, and it, it can be fixed, but okay. What happens is it, get, it gets into a spiral. And this is a theory, so there's no mathematical basis for this bit. So you can't sort of drag it, it's not solid as the other part. But this is sort of a observational theory that in the end, it basically, economically speaking, you get corruption, so people stop participating. As they stop participating, they stop uh, seeing value in joining in because they don't believe there's any point that's corrupt. So you don't join in the process if you don't believe you're going to get anything out of it. So you pull away, and eventually you get things like the Great Persian Nation walking away, and you, everybody's worse off. This is the depressing bit. And then the rich then forget how money is made because they've got money. And when I say the rich, I'm talking about the very rich, you know. Uh, but effectively, they start fighting with each other. And the interesting thing is this is what's happening in Russia right now, that Putin is going, apparently, I can't say he is, but I believe, according to the media, which I don't necessarily believe, he is killing his billionaires. The billionaires are dying, and that's because they turn on each other. So in this, there's a guy called Hobbes who predicts all this. It's called a Hobbesian sort of mm -hmm. worldview. Uh, and effectively, what happens is as corruption gets worse, everybody, all the rich turn on each other, they all kill each other more than the polite style, and it happened in the French Revolution. So it's a, it's a wonderfully depressing topic. Um, <laughs> so, and then the, eventually it ends with uh, sort of a, a period where people just come back uh, and that sort of thing. So it's better to have nice creative places where we all get along and we somewhat participate in the democratic process. That's better. Okay, so one of the things that you can do is governments can make a difference and they can create innovation by allowing for democratic feedback, allowing feedback loops, allowing people to participate. Really, to be honest, you should take a poll of the people in a room and you should actually create ideas from that. But you have to manage it in a way where you get the best out of people and not where there's biases and things. So there's a lot of stuff that has to be done to do that. But you can actually build innovation out of a group of people. Uh, I've done it before uh, and it's it's interesting. You know, you get, you get the best ideas from random people. You know, you don't get the best ideas from experts. You get the best ideas from talking to a group of people and just in your brain. So to do that, you need to make friendly policies. So Melbourne largely <coughs> ranked well by Tennant and Brax, <coughs> and Brisbane, the larger council we said before. So there is a thing called the Austrian School of Economics, uh, which has some of these policies in it, and you can read that. Uh, it's very dense, but there's a lot of stuff in there that's quite interesting. 
And then there's other things in canes which are interesting that you can apply. Uh, John Maynard Keynes. So basically, to understand economics, instead of getting into it, I was thinking people might debate me on economics a lot, but we didn't. We ended up stuck on the indicator. So <laughs> this part, I had a, pre a prepared thing because I've had that before. Uh, economics is like basically KFC. You know, it's like herbs and spices. A bit of Keynes, a bit of uh, Friedman, a bit of a bit of Austrian school, a bit of this, a bit of that works best. If you think you're right about economics, the answer is it depends. So that's why the indicators are the way they are, because you can't say you're right. If you pull this lever and you keep pulling startups, eventually they'll stop working. It's like monetary policy, you print money, you know, eventually it stops working. What do they do? Print money. Is it working anymore now? No, we've got high interest rates. So they printed money, they gave us inflation. There's actually a whole bunch of text written about that. If you print money, you get inflation. So, you know, it's not that we didn't know we weren't going to get inflation. We were going to get inflation since we started printing money. It's just a question of how long it takes. Okay, our biggest problem in Australia, we, we basically have too many monopolies. Coles and Woolworths, 51% plus of retail. Coles and Woolworths should be broken up. No questions, no debate, no nothing on that. It's just, they're destroying large slabs of economic value. You break up the monopolies. When America broke up um, uh, uh, the Trust Act, sorry, oh, Bell. Bell, yeah, okay, that, that created huge amounts of innovation. When they broke up Exxon Mobil, it created huge amounts of innovation. So, uh, well, Exxon Mobil was called Standard Oil. But basically, you break up monopolies, you create innovation. Australia has too many monopolies. Telstra, Optus, uh, Telstra, everything in every industry, we've got two companies that control it. <coughs> There's no new stocks really on the stock exchange. It's consistent with the same old banks, the same old. We break them up, shatter them into pieces, and make them all. Make them when all you them. say, would that make things uh, less expensive for people? Is that Probably. what you're saying? Yes. Okay. So I, I, really, I have another speech on this about inflation, but there's a thing. Uh, does anybody shop at local markets? Who shops at local markets? Okay. How much do you save on your fruit and veg compared to Coles and Woolworths? Yeah, a lot. Oh, it's, it's more than 40% in my opinion. 50%, yeah. 50%, okay. So let's say I, I put it at 40 where I live. But So a capsicum that's $15 will be better from a fruit and veg store or markets at $8 a kilo. Mm. So are Coles and Woolworths efficient at delivering fruit and vegetables? No. But they're efficient at, at ensuring you have a year round supply of fruit and vegetables and they keep a competitive price limit on the fruit and veg stores. So without Coles and Woolworths, fruit and veg stores would raise their prices. But on the other hand, if you're shopping at Coles and Woolworths and surprised that you've been suffering inflation, your inflation is a Coles and Woolworths phenomenon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Coles and Woolworths just charge whatever they feel like. And that's how it works. So you don't shop there, you shop uh, markets and you just save money. So yeah, yeah. I, I think that answers your question sort of. Yeah. I've been yeah. talking for a long time, I get confused at this point. <laughs> brain goes into mushy. I need alcohol. <laughs> um, I need alcohol and something fried or something, I don't know, a bit of carbohydrates and things. Um, so I just want to answer a couple of quick points. So what can, oh, I've got to mention that. So basically what can, be, the best way to create innovation is lots of companies doing stuff. And you can include social enterprises as long as they're tightly defined and they achieve something. They don't just sit around taking government money and having bean bags. They've got to do something for a social enterprise to work. It's got to have an outcome where it does something. Um, you know, but you can include any type of enterprise in that. Okay. This is one of my training groups I did over in the Middle East. Uh, I don't offer public training. It's just, once again, somebody has to pay. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, so this is a, was done through a public institution in the Middle East. But you see, it was a very mixed group and very intelligent and interesting. There's actually about 12 nationalities in that photo. Um, it was really fun. Uh, okay, so what you can do about innovation, you can either relocate or you can wait for the innovation to catch up. So who's happy with Brisbane? Show of hands after all this, who's happy? Big, bigger show of hands just so I can see a bit better. Okay, mostly happy. Okay, who's unhappy with Brisbane or thinks it could be a lot better? Okay, you said positive things before, it's confusing me now. <laughs> you know, one? No, I think it's growing very fast uh, yeah. and uh, we're losing a little bit the, the characteristic of what Brisbane used to be. Yes. Uh, and 
I think, I think as, as I say, it's a unique uh, city. There is a city, there is a suburbs around, mm. and we're sprinkling new farms and so on. And uh, it's a lot of characteristic, but I think we are losing out by uh, uh, constructions, development. Yeah, so and property uh, developers, a good point, they do tend to destroy a city yeah. sometimes because they have, they have to make money. And the way they make money is to make lower grade apartments sometimes. Now, good developers don't do that, but there's a lot of, in Melbourne they approved, I think it was a hundred buildings. So Matthew Guy, when he was planning minister, the current opposition leader, approved, I think it was a hundred buildings, and he didn't really take any much look at what they were. Didn't and he this, get a kickback for them? Wasn't I can't the, say that he did or didn't. Yeah, but that was the... The I can't say that he did or didn't. No, but that was... <laughs> I can't say that he did or didn't. Mooted, wasn't it? That he I can't like... say that he did or didn't because I don't know, but he did approve a lot of buildings. Yeah. On the other hand, there are good boutique property developers who add value and do stuff. So if you didn't have property developers, you wouldn't have apartments. If you didn't have apartments, you wouldn't have higher density living. But you, government's role is to encourage better property developers and punish bad ones. That's what government should do. So punish the bad property developers, the ones that knock up the town towers that are really cheap and ugly. So yeah, and that's why Brisbane will lose some of it. But to yeah, me, it's a, it's a it's a money making exercise at the end, isn't it? But it has for to the, be for the for the developer. I mean, more people you bring, more economy, more uh, more real estate goes up. I mean, it's all it's all. No, simple. but but it has to be money making because at the end of the day, somebody has to pay for the building, and people get amenities. <coughs> like a lot of people like living in apartments, like West End. People love living in West End. And you can only live in West End in an apartment. But uh, hardly 20 years ago, we didn't have any, any apartment, a high rise building in Brisbane. It was to be all houses. Yeah, and that it, was only 20 years ago. So it is, a city is better, generally speaking, as a general opinion, that uh, from some like research, but it's not very hard research, it would be that cities generally have a human scale. And so Paris banned any buildings over, I think it's seven stories in the centre, and that's, that makes it better. Melbourne has allowed all the, all the apartment towers in the CBD, creating a wind tunnel effect, and that's damaged the city of Melbourne quite a lot. Yeah, uh, New York has done the same thing, and that's created a lot of damage, but New York's famous for it, yeah, so uh, okay. Michelle, maybe let's park that let, point. Yeah, and let, I think, yeah, I think let park it. Finish, yeah. we, we agree, yeah, I agree yeah. that there's something there. So what you can do about innovation is either move, participate in council and give them some, change them on one thing. So if you can change one thing that you think is important, like a park or a bench or a... Uh, a, a cycle way or something you think is important. So if you have one issue, the best way to change something usually is to have one issue and focus on that with government. One issue. And then that, that's the thing you can achieve change with. Um, you can move to a city like Miami if you like a more open American style city. If you're not, if you're left wing, you won't like Miami. Uh, the same with Dallas, you won't like Dallas if you're left wing. If you're right wing, you probably will. Um, if you're left wing, you might like a city in, in California, but you won't want to live near the worst part. So you might want to say uh, somewhere a bit south of San Francisco is quite nice. You know, it's really quite a nice spot. And California's a massive state, so it's a really good place to live, move to. Sweden is a wonderful place. Uh, Stockholm's a wonderful place, you know, but they have some problems depending on where you live. So it's all very subjective. But we can use the, there's ways to use a ranking to sort of figure it out. Innovation is based on trust, and trust is undermined by corruption. I'm just going to end on a couple, two things, right? So cities have an essence. So the point is to make Brisbane more Brisbane and Melbourne more Melbourne. That's the point. So if a city, a city, a city comes, a city has what attracts you. So you probably like Brisbane. You want Brisbane to be more Brisbane. So that's what you're saying. You want Brisbane to be more Brisbane. Yeah, yeah. To, yeah, to keep the characteristic having a well balance. Yeah. And uh, too much, too not too much population. I mean, that's. Uh, that's, that's your version of it, but in a sense, everybody has a version. But you want Seoul to be more Seoul, or Korea as you don't want Tokyo to change. Well, what some people want is every city in the world to be the same. This is bad, because mm -hmm. then you want the city to be itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why don't you talk? I think we'll okay, take maybe, that yeah, let's, yeah, let's yeah. Because that's actually a good point, but it's it's a step that, yeah. But change is essential to cities, and you have to change. Yeah. Um, okay, I'm just going to end on this bit. So that's the, the link to download the index in Excel. Okay, and then there's a most there's, the calling details are just for someone there, but I've got a link tree there, and if you go there, there's a substack on there, you can subscribe to the newsletter or you can connect to me on LinkedIn. I do answer requests on LinkedIn and um, 
I haven't put my email because I get I've got eighty thousand unread emails. <laughs> I get four hundred emails a day. I can't read. People get offended. I don't answer my phone. Um, I have no <laughs> means of actually managing my life. I'm a total disaster. Um, you need some innovation in there. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I really am a disaster at times. I, I can't help it. It's just all people who do research or do any sort of data work, scientific, technical people, tend to be a bit of a disaster. It's, it comes with the territory. Uh, you, you have a great idea, then you forget that you left the hot plate on and you left your house. I actually put my set fire in my friend's house on. So that sort of thing is, yeah. Anyway, link tree, and that's me, and then you can get the, the Gazette, and you've got the download link on that. So that's about it. And there is one activity I'll give you just before I go. So if you think something's bad, so what's a policy right now? Pick a policy you're angry about. What's something you're angry about? Mm. Government policy, anything. Or yeah. happy about? The Olympics. Okay, Olympics. Okay, what's two positives about the Olympics? It'll bring tourism, right? And it'll probably it'll probably bring uh, lots of infrastructure which you can use. <coughs> what's a negative? It'll be crowded, and and you might be priced out of property if that's your problem. And then what's an interesting point? An interesting point is that it might change the city fundamentally. So there's a little thing t technique you can use every time you get angry about something. I don't want to say I do this. It's called the PMI game. It's by a guy called Edward de Bono. But every time you think a policy is bad, look for a, something positive in it. If you think it's good, look for a negative. There's always a negative. Every policy is the dog with fleas, just don't know where the fleas are. Every policy. So there's no good or bad in some respects. Um, that's a long debate. All right, I'm just gonna put the link tree back and that's it. That concludes my presentation, thank you. <laughs> government tends to think that if you build a big building, magic will happen, or if you build an incubator, magic will happen. And if you allow people to talk to each other and interact, then people innovate. If you block people off in silos, innovation is very bad for innovation. So think about any big old company you work for where nobody talked to everybody and nobody communicated. And it picked a big company. How was the innovation level? Pretty sucky, right? Yeah, exactly. So basically, government's main policy area is to ensure that they don't damage a good community and to keep communities going. So if you look at Barcelona, Barcelona's done very, very well on community and streets and public policy and social welfare and all that stuff. And so Barcelona's a really good benchmark for some part of improving. So Brisbane would copy from Barcelona, let's say. But that's a very simplistic answer. And if you did that, just gave it to a policy advisor to do, no, that's enough. So it's very complicated answer, but the simple answer is you preserve community. Damage community, you damage innovation in the long run. That would be the biggest thing. That's great. Okay, so we are going to do a bit of community building. Jim is on the ball. So yeah. we can. <laughs>